Greetings, Austrian to fans of Mises. So our course should not be disrupted nearly as much as many of them are, because every single one of you has this. If you don't have your physical copy, I've sent you links. You have the entire book, first edition, the one we're using, and uh, it's accessible anywhere in the world outside of, uh, what, North Korea. So you should be OK. Um, everything we do in this course is about reading this. I'm counting on you guys to make this work. I can't go through and uh, 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 lecture on everything. I'm going to give you some high points for it. And we will proceed. As far as exams go, I'm going to get those back to you. Uh, and any f the further future exam is going to be purely a take-home exam. Um, I'm, I'm quite sure at this point. And uh, so what I want to do today is just hit some highlights for chapter 16 on prices. What we will do in the future is talk, I'll give little highlights of some of the chapters. If you have questions, you're to send those to me. I will then cover those both on video and if we can get it set up, we may do some Zoom sessions. So keep that time slot available Tuesday, Thursday, 9.30 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time and we'll try to make that work. Uh, I know that that'll be hard for some people, but we'll do the best we can with this. Um, I'll tell you what, we can make this work. We've got Mises, let's read it. So today I'm going to talk about a little bit about chapter 16. There's some highlights, there's some very important stuff here. This is where Mises really is diverging from the neoclassical mainstream. I want to talk in particular about part one, the pricing process, two, valuation and appraisement, three, prices of higher order goods. I want to talk about those sections, maybe a bit about the accounting section. Uh, and then maybe touch on the goodwill, part 12, connexity of prices, 13, prices and income, 15, the chimera of non-market prices. And important stuff here, but here's one of the most important stories that you need to have. Get the idea of price taking out of your head. That's what Mises is trying to do in these initial sections. Price taking is not what we're talking about. Price as a parameter. It's very easy for even us Austrians to fall into this, into this problem. Oh, we look at the price and decide what to do. This is not exactly what's happening. Uh, it's something different and it's complex. Follow this. Uh, let me begin by trying to, trying to lay out. Mises starts out in this section one. He talks about barter, bilateral trade, the thin market uh, that is very little trading in it. And of course, you think about something like an Edgeworth box. Uh, if you know what that is. In the Edgeworth box, there are multiple equilibria, different places to which they could trade. Bargaining games show the same thing. But you get to a thick market, a widely traded market, Mises shows or argues, and you have many buyers and sellers. You will tend to converge on uh, narrow margins, a single price. I'm going to give you a model that illustrates what Mises is getting at. Mises asks whether catalactics and the market modeling assume that traders have perfect information or complete information? The answer is no. That's what equilibrium does. Uh, Mises is talking about the market as being something outside of equilibrium and the processes that we actors engage in that generate the tendencies, the trends, and, 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 and such. Um, so no assumption of perfect information or anything along those lines. Let me show you something about this. Um, I like this little model, and I'm going to put dollars per unit on this axis. So this will be a Marshallian, an Alfred Marshall's space that he works in, uh, like for a Marshall demand, Marshallian demand curve. And this is the example. This will, I think, show how pernicious this idea of price taking is. Um, if we just draw demand, supply we manage your focus right there well, well where else would there's disequilibrium why would anybody else uh, why would you stay outside of there well hang on a sec i'm going to put we're going to think of this as being the horse market i picked horses because bombavirk and clark had a debate over whether or not we should use continuous or discrete functions can you talk about this being continuous that is a straight line or a line, or should we talk about individual units? And Bombavrik said you want to stay with, this is a reason 
by using individual units will help you see what's going on. Suppose that I'm going to put, I'm going to arrange all of the maximum, the buyers. I'm going to get, mark their willingness to pay with a zero or that little O. That's the buyers maximum willingness to pay. And I'm going to use an X, and I'll switch colors, from the minimum willingness of a seller to accept. That's their minimum willingness, the least they would sell a horse for. And I'm going to arrange them from high to low. So the, for the potential buyers, uh, this person's willing to pay a lot for the first horse. For the second, the next offer would be less. Third, I need five of these. Great. Okay, I've got those on there. Next, I'm going to put on the uh, uh, sellers. Arrange those from least to biggest uh, in f terms of their minimum that they would accept for a horse. And we want it to be a little bit lower than that. Want that one to be a little bit lower than that. We'll have that one be right there. And that one will be there. And that one will be right there. Let's get that out of the way so we don't confuse them. And OK, good. I've arranged those things. Uh, suppose that everyone I'm going to give you, show you an equal, uh, a, 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 not a, a, a set of possible trades. Nobody will give up a horse for less than their willingness to accept. No one will pay more than their minimum, maximum willingness to pay. And so here's a set of possible trades. Um, this guy meets this guy and buys that horse at a price somewhere between theirs. This guy meets this gal, buys that horse. This person trades, they trade theirs. And these two trade. This person offers that, and they trade, and they offer that. Great. What do you have? You have five prices. No one has paid more than their maximum willingness to pay. No one has accepted less than their milling, will, minimum willingness to accept. Now, why would that happen? Well, pretty clearly, that person didn't realize they were willing to pay so much more, they could have bid something away. They didn't know about these other trades. Knowledge is crucial in this story. To assume perfect information or anything approximating that takes you to the equilibrium, but that's pernicious. How do they know? How do you know who's, what the off possibilities are? Now, Mises points out that with repeated trading, you've got a chance for discovery, for learning about these things. That's why the more trading in the market, the thickly traded market, you would expect it to converge because uh, you know, in equilibrium, if we drew this as a demand and supply curve, we would expect the equilibrium to be right around here. Why should this, uh, why should that person be selling a horse at all? They value it more than those marginal buyers. Same for that one. Those are the trades that should occur. These people ought to keep their horses. Um, that's what we would think. So uh, this idea, people learn, they observe, they notice more quickly. Some people do. And those who are better at it, they, they make gains from it. Entrepreneurship, but should drive that, uh, drive that. And so Mises says the driving force of the market. All action has entrepreneurship, but he says it's the promoter entrepreneur that is the, uh, yeah, the, business, the businessman who, or businesswoman who is an entrepreneur. Great, so this is something that's essential to understand here. We're not looking at price as a parameter, but rather people discovering uh, opportunities and then acting on them. Now, another thing to say, point out here is that, that Mises points out, is that in equilibrium, in an, in an evenly rotating economy, all prices are final prices. For every market, we'd be right there, okay? And so there, there's no chance for further trade. So great. But ERE, equal, evenly rotating economy, can't show how we would actually get there. We need a theory about that. This is, the, this is an important Austrian contribution uh, from Mises. 
Um, he also refers to, uh, um, makes a, a, some additional comment about trying to use statistics and historical prices because those things tend to assume equilibrium prices. When we an analyze, do our statistical analyses, econometrics and things, we think of equilibrium prices. How do you know? And he points out the problems of aggregating uh, observed prices into, into averages. And so you think about this, um, uh, quality and quantity of goods change across time. Uh, the kind of, uh, the quantities traded matter. You know, $5 and we trade five tons of wheat versus $5 a bushel and we're trading a million tons of wheat. Those, those are very different stories. Did the price stay constant? Uh, I said wheat. How many kinds of wheat are there? We uh, economists like to say, great, there's the price of horses or the price of wheat. Let me change that to, to wheat. How many kinds of wheat are there? We're going to aggregate those. Well, the USDA recognizes 40 different kinds in law or regula regulation. There are 40 different kinds of wheat. Unless you count the subclassifications, and there's 60 kinds. And I can tell you that in the private market, there are more than that. Um, houses, think about houses. Um, Mises uses the example of shoes between what, 1923 and 1936 or something. Um, we can think about cars between eight, uh, 1989 and 2009 uh, would be grossly different, uh, or 20, yeah, something like that. Think about this, houses. People talk about, well, look at what's happened to the price of houses. A house today, the average size of house is about 10 times what it was, say, in 1960. So holding those, saying that that's the price of a house, they're just totally different goods right now, are very different. So you can't truly isolate these things. The use of these statistics isn't wrong, but it's interpretive. It has to require judgment, verstehen. It's, it's, it's not that it's set in any way. So that's an important thing to, to recognize. Great. All right, that's section one, and it introduces this, I think, I think nicely. Let's move to section two, which is valuation and appraisement. If we want to understand this pricing process, we need to understand this, and then we'll apply it from there. We'll move to the prices of higher order goods. So with the uh, valuation and, uh, and appraisement, remember what valuation is. Valuation is ranking. Valuation is ranking of things in order. It's ordinal, so A is preferred to B, for example. No numerical value to that. Uh, it's just that this is better than that. And how do we get trade? Well, person X has the ranking A is preferred to B. Person Y has the ranking B is preferred to A. And so they trade. Uh-huh, well, we all understand that. Differing valuations. They trade an A for a B. There's no equality here. There's no equality. There isn't something that can really be, you just say that that's the, the rate at which they traded those things. Now, what's appraisement then? Mises, uh, Mises points this out, and this is crucial to his story. Appraisement is the anticipation, or I, I would simply say guessing, hopefully educated guessing, at future prices. This is crucial for the entrepreneur. Okay. At the future prices. And we're going to look at expected prices, in other words. And that is these expected prices are ratios of money to goods. Great, I'm thinking of producing atlatls, and I'm thinking, what do I think the demand will be tomorrow for an atlatl? Um, so I'm thinking, I'm guessing about that. Well, how do, I, how do I judge those things? The individual in the market economy looks at fluctuating prices and thinks of those as signaling the current prices, or 
really just past prices, are pretty good indicators maybe of what the, uh, first of all, of what maybe the future prices will be. They're also indicators of the opportunity cost of things that were foregone. So you're learning a lot from them, uh, but these are not, we're not about equilibrium prices. We're observing things and thinking about what price might prevail in the future. Should we, you know, and you think, for example, you're thinking of something like toilet paper. Uh, the other day it was in, what, $10 a pack for toilet paper. Um, I kind of think that usually I would say, huh, well then I bet tomorrow the $10 a pack for toilet paper. Uh, some unanticipated change. If I anticipate it, I buy in advance or produce in advance or something because uh, I predict that that price won't stay. Um, as it turns out, might have been right if I predicted that. Um, at any rate, so this is, this is the true pricing process that uh, people engage in. Entrepreneurs look at, often will look at current prices and use that as an indicator to help them guess what future prices will be, but also how they perceive the future. And if they're successful, of course, they earn, they earn profit. But that's what generates prices. And those prices are ratios of money to, uh, ratios of money um, to uh, goods. Calculation becomes possible. Anything important uh, else? Many other things we could talk about there, but I think that hits at the point. Now, uh, of course, it's not so hard to see how that applies perhaps to uh, uh, the, the uh, consumer goods. What about prices of higher order goods? I'll say very little about this, but it is uh, quite important. If you go back to your history of economic thought notes or think about those lectures, um, Menger talked about how we can generate prices from consumer behavior, but what about the higher order goods, the producer goods, the factors of production? How do those prices come about? Mises' story is this. The entrepreneur looks at prices, uh, the expected prices for outputs, looks at what he thinks he or she can purchase factors of production for, decides whether there's enough of a discrepancy to make it worthwhile, taking interest into account that is uh, the fact that you're going to get paid into the future, um, time preference, and makes that acts in that way. So the makes a makes a judgment accordingly. So the connection here for higher order goods is not between utility, the utility is not being passed up, it's the pricing that is being passed up. Mises begins with that. Consumers value and then they price first order goods. Entrepreneurs appraise first order goods and then act to generate the prices of higher order goods through appraisement. Great. If everybody has guessed right and there's nobody expecting further change and they were right, that's the equally ro evenly rotating economy. Um, the prices of higher order goods plus interest will equal the price of the first order good in the evenly rotating economy. That's Mises on page 331. And that is not going to hold. Market action is entrepreneurship. It is spotting those, those uh, opportunities, those errors, entrepreneurial errors, and making things better. So it's a necessary, the entrepreneur is a necessary link to the consumer. This is not something that is, can be dispensed with. And the entrepreneur prevents the persistence of production that fails to satisfy consumer demands in the cheapest way. The entrepreneur prevents the persistence of mistaken allocations by spotting the discrepancies, making things better. Page 333. Milton Friedman says that, the, that a businessman should be focused on profit making, not social responsibility. That, that confirms this. This is stopping mistakes and making things better. And again, entrepreneurs use present prices from the recent past as guesstimates for the future, but they've also got all kinds of other things they're thinking about. Expected demand. What's the government going to do? Other kinds of things they try to take into account. Um, great. Um, so, um, false Mises says 
if you have an, a good functioning economy, the false prices, well functioning economy, false prices unlikely to exist. And this pricing process though is social. Neither Crusoe nor Stalin, the central planner, can do it. Okay? So that's important to note. This requires different people buying, selling, and bidding on the market. Great, we've covered all that. Um, I'm going to skip a, a bit about, I think the cast accounting chapter is all, or section is also essential. Uh, but I shall, it, basically there he talks about issues such as on page uh, 337 uh, in that second, every, uh, that discussion of, of, uh, of uh, the various con conditions that affect cost accounting. Well, he's talking through here about constant return to scale, uh, decreasing return to scale, and things like that. 338, he really is getting into increasing returns to scale. So, uh, we'll, we'll call that good. Um, chap section five, logical versus mathematical catalactics. He wants us to focus on the logic. Simply treating this as a mathematical problem tends to take us to focusing only on equilibrium and we miss everything that is going on in the economy. We miss the human action. Um, he's got a, there's an aside here where uh, he, 349, Professor Paul H. Douglas, one of the inventors of the Cobb-Douglas function, Douglas praised the outcome of Schultz's studies on, on, uh, uh, on, on elasticities, saying, a work necessary to make economics a more or less exact science as was the determination of atomic weights for the development of chemistry. And uh, Mises blasts Douglas and says that's ridiculous because atomic weights in chemistry are, we think, constant. And he's talking about, you know, uh, uh, the Schultz work is looking at a historical fact. In some certain area, it, we estimate that the price elasticity of potatoes was, was something, but that's, but it changes. It's, it's, not a, it's not a constant, it's a historical fact. And Mises is correct about this. Douglas, a lot of other people ended up making fun of Douglas's comment, and we've changed the way we think about econometrics since then. Um, all through this section, if you know how to read between the lines, there are blasts at Edgeworth and at, at uh, whether classical mechanics and Marshall and others, um, and Walras. <laughs> so let's move quickly to chapter se uh, section seven, goodwill. I just want to point out that Mises has this discussion about goodwill. Now, this is not very controversial today. We would probably call it reputation. When Mises was writing, 1949, this was considered outlandish. Uh, what's that? That seems sort of, that doesn't seem very, well, it's, it seems kind of fishy. Um, it seems kind of subjective. Well, it is subjective. Um, Mises points out how important this is. His work, um, work there is really ahead of its time, or all the other economists were behind the time. Um, we'll skip, I'm going to skip all the discussion of demand. In some ways, it's kind of straightforward. Um, it's lengthy. And bottom line is that Mises says this is one of the places where the mathematical model is not all that misleading. I think it's still personally problematic, but um, can teach you something. Um, but at any rate, let's quickly go to the connexity of prices. And again, this is the, where Mises points out that uh, all goods are... Uh, demand for all goods should be, the people's demands will be influenced by other, other prices. Uh, the way that Wal Ross treated this, if you want to look at my History of Economic Thought lecture, now available on, on video in the HET, uh, the HET folder, if you want to look at that, uh, Wal Ross, of course, has the demand for, I would think of it this way, the demand for hamburger is uh, a function of the price of hamburger but it's also influenced by the price of hot dogs. Let's not talk about it in mathematics. It's influenced by the price of hot dogs. It's influenced by the price of ketchup, hamburger buns, beer, atlatls, because I could spend my money on atlatls instead of hamburger. It's influenced by the price of, uh, of charcoal. If I grill my hamburgers, I spend them together, etc. 
So uh, everything, every, this is how things are connected through these prices. Uh, and the entrepreneur, buyers and sellers are acting in that way uh, to connect them. Prices and incomes, uh, the prices aren't arbitrary. We've already said that. Neither are incomes. That's the prices that people have earned from, from their labor. Um, so messing around with that stuff is not warranted. We'll, we'll, we'll uh, continue with that as we go. Um, Mises emphasizes this. And finally, I want to hit uh, this discussion of the chimera of non-market prices. And Mises says, look, the price, there are no, no, there are no prices outside of this market process. They aren't things that somehow exist out there uh, in a higher platonic dimension, and, and we're just trying to find them. They, we're, we're generating prices, but there's no other, there's no alternative here. And uh, the idea of non-market price, uh, when I read this, when I read this today, um, <laughs> Mises says, a government can no more determine prices than a goose can lay hen's eggs. When I worked in consulting, uh, USDA uh, RMA, Risk Management Agency, we, were, we developed a crop insurance program for them. And uh, it was for, this is the one that was done for uh, Christmas trees, uh, commercial Christmas tree production. And nobody has any data. We searched, no one has a price series on Christmas trees. What's the prices? It's, it's, it's a closely guarded secret by the producers. Uh, proprietary and really hard to get and we couldn't get that information well uh, the government officials said we one of our one of the things we told them was you have to start collecting data if you expect this uh, to work you got to find a way to get data on Christmas trees and they said uh, prices why don't you just develop a model that will predict it <laughs> uh, okay <laughs> I guess you're paying us to do that we will go ahead and develop a model but it you It'll be BS. When you do price forecasting, you always have to have market prices to guess what the future price, put it into an econometric model or a forecasting model. You have to have some sort of an input, which is real world prices, even to guess at them. There are no non-market prices. Great. We're going to move next to indirect exchange. And that's where Mises introduces money. And for that one, again, I'm going to give some, for some of these sections, I'm going to give my own presentation to uh, kind of help with it. And then action in the passing of time. We'll do these quickly, but get to reading. I am counting on you guys, and I want you to really know this stuff. It's more important than ever because we're facing an economic disruption. And if you want to understand what's going on and how maybe we're going to get out of this, this is the material you need. Okay. So, keep at it.